Hello and welcome to another episode of Zenotes Live. We have Afreen with us and today we will be covering gas exchange in humans. Over to you, Afreen. Hello, everyone. So like Ashwarya said, today we're doing IGCC Biology Chapter 11, that is gas exchange in humans. So to start off, we're going to look at the syllabus. So we're going to describe some of the features that the human gas exchange or just gas exchange systems in mammals generally. And then we will look at some diagrams and try to, you know, differentiate the different parts of the system. And then we we'll, you know, look at the air composition that we're breathing in and then what we're exhaling. And then we we'll look at some of the effects of exercising and all that in uh, on our breathing. OK, so to, first of all, like I said, we're going to look at the features of the gas exchange surfaces. Now, the number one and the most common, most easy to remember um, feature is that the walls inside the gas exchange surface, it's specifically the alveoli, it's very, very thin, specifically one cell thick. So it's easy for, it's probably quite easy for you to remember that and it would benefit you because could be a key, key point in some answer keys, not really in other answer keys. Just me remember that because could benefit you and the reason for this thick one cell thick wall is that the distance for diffusion to occur is shorter so it's more efficient so the gas can gases can exchange easily so the whole purpose of all these features is to facilitate gas exchange and for it to be more efficient faster better you know in order to accommodate uh, in order to supply the requirement our cells need the second point is large surface area. So this is actually a very common point in diffusion. The larger the surface area, the faster the rate of diffusion. So the same thing applies here. Our lungs have a very, very large surface area. So multiple, many molecules can diffuse at the same time. So once again, the whole system, the whole process is much more faster. And then the gas exchange system is the surfaces are moist in order to keep the cells alive and healthy. That's really it, but it's not very popular, a very well-known fact. The, the uh, previous two will probably fetch you more marks. They're probably more solid facts. And the next one is it's well-ventilated. Once again, this one's important. There's uh, a suitable concentration gradient for oxygen and carbon dioxide. So when there's a strong, when there's a steep concentration gradient, the gas can exchange more easily. They can diffuse more easily. So that's why you notice that when the air you inhale has a different composition than the air you exhale. That's to facilitate gas exchange. And then, OK, last but not least, it's close. The gas exchange surfaces are close to blood supply. This is, again, to keep it well ventilated. And also, you know, there's a fresh supply of blood because the blood is where carbon, carbon dioxide is carried and oxygen is carried and, you know, transported to various parts in our bodies. So that's why it needs to be close to the blood supply so that gases can exchange easily quickly and more readily and yeah that's about the surfaces that's about the features of the gas exchange surface now we're looking at some of the parts in the, the ga human gas exchange system there's the cartilage cartilage is found in the trachea you'll find that around somewhere around here and the main purpose of the of trachea is to prevent it from the the main purpose of cartilage in the trachea is to prevent the trachea from collapsing when there when the air inside is absent so you know if in case there was no trachea and there was no air inside your trachea would collapse and then it would just be not okay so that's why you have cartilage and it basically is like a support system and it protects it supports it so it keeps it standing even when air is absent so that's the purpose of the cartilage next is the ribs the ribs you should already know the main purpose of the ribs is to pr protect vital organs and blood vessels and also the ribs expand and contract when you're breathing in and out so take a deep breath in take a deep breath out you'd see the movement in your rib cage it's move it's contracting and expanding as you breathe in and breathe out so we'll look at the details of that part later. Next, we have the intercostal muscles, internal and external intercostal muscles, to be more specific. 
this is these are the muscles that basically help our ribs expand and contract so the ribs are bones itself and they you know they need muscles to pull them and then relax in order to move so the intercostal muscles are the muscles that are doing that particular job so they are situated in between the ribs and they create and they move the chest wall so when you're breathing in the external intercostal muscles are contracting and the internal intercostal muscles are relaxing and the vice versa is true for when you're breathing out okay so next is the diaphragm diaphragm produces volume and pressure changes in the thorax leading to the ventilation of the lungs so this is basically when you're breathing in you notice that your chest cavity ha um it's larger so there's more volume inside and then if you remember from physics if you do take physics p v p1 v1 equals to p2 v2 so when pressure when the volume increases pressure decreases and so due to the pressure gradient air flows in from the outside to inside your lungs to you know fulfill the gas exchange whatever is going on and then the same thing hap the opposite happens when you're breathing out so if you breathe out the volume decreases pressure increases and so down the pressure gradient the pre the air moves out of your lungs and to the atmosphere around you so that's the basics of in, um, breathing in and out we will look that look into that more into more detail but for now let's look at the diagram so you've got the larynx that's your that that's the part that comes before your trachea but that's not very important right now what's important is the trachea itself that's the windpipe and if you notice you can you see the cartilage rings around the trachea and then you see the lungs the lungs are the two giant muscles of sac of tissues that you see here and then you see the bronchus the bronchus is basically like the 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 tree like structure that spreads from that that connects your trachea to your lungs and you see the it looks it looks branched it looks like a tree inside your lungs now these bronch bronchi they expand into bronchioles and those are the bronchioles are basically the branches and then the bronchioles expand into alveoli and alveoli it, this is the, the in the zoomed in diagram you see the alveoli these are like little sacs the air filled sacs large surface area and you notice the blood vessels the veins and the arteries where blood is um moving where there's a fresh supply of blood to the alveoli for more efficient exchange of gases and yeah so the alveoli is where the main gas exchange occurs so when you're thinking about gas exchange you will have to be able to visualize the alveoli you have to be able to visualize the blood vessels carrying and deoxygenated blood and then dropping the carbon dioxide and then picking up oxygen so it becomes oxygenated and then you know the whole process of blood moving through the body occurs so yeah that's basically what's happening here and then what you notice after the bronchial there is the diaphragm so the diaphragm is a dome shaped tissue like it like what's shown here and that's what's you know expanding and contracting when you're breathing in and out so that's what's causing the volume and pressure changes inside your lungs in order to in order for air to flow in or out of your lungs as needed okay like i said there's a difference between the air you inhale and the air you exhale so if you see the words inspired air and expired air don't get confused inspired is basically inhaled air and expired is basically exhaled air pretty much yeah it's pretty much the same thing so now the difference between the two is that first we'll look at the inspired air oxygen in the inspired air it's 21% and then in expired air it's 16%. So these are numbers you'll actually have to memorize because in the exam there could be tables that they ask you to fill in and some of these values might be given or they may or may not be given depending on the marks for which this quest the, the question accounts for. So it's very um I would recommend that you memorize these numbers and the corresponding element. So for example, oxygen in the expired air it's 21% of the air is oxygen while in the expired air only 16% is oxygen. And then carbon dioxide in the inspired air the carbon dioxide composition is 0.04 while in the expired air it's 4%. Now nitrogen you'll notice that there's no change 
inspired and expired both are 78 percent and that's because our body has no use for the nitrogen that comes in this form because nitrogen um, air molecules nitrogen molecules have a triple um bond so the, it's very very strong and we cannot use nitrogen in that form and we don't really need it in that form we've got other sources from our food the proteins so yeah that's that's about nitrogen so that's why you notice that what you breathe in is the exact same as what you breathe out in case of nitrogen and then water water yeah it depends on your climate on the weather for the particular weather event of that day but the only thing is you'll need to remember is that the expired air has a higher water composition than the inspired air so you'll see that expired air is saturated water vapor so that's just basically more water vapor than what you have in inhaled so um, on a cold day, you go near a window and you breathe on the glass, you see water vapor. That's basically what you're exhaling. And then the temperature of the air that you breathe out, once again, the inspired air depends on your climate, on your weather, the particular day. But the expired air is always warm because obviously it's coming out of your body, so it's going to be warm. And another part of this, uh, you'd be asked for paper six, perhaps even paper four, but more likely paper six is the test for carbon dioxide. So that's basically you and a positive result means that the solution has turned cloudy. So that's basically a milky white color. So that's what cloudy means over here in this case. Okay, the effects of physical activity. Yeah, oops, right. Yeah, physical activity increases the breathing rate more breaths per minute and the tidal volume so more air per breath so when you do so if you take a jog you'll notice that your breathing the frequency of how much you breathe has increased and also the depth of how you're breathing so like you deep breather after a physical activity so that's basically what the tidal volume sentence means you're breathing in more air per breath and then this is measured with a spirometer to produce a spirogram, but this is not really of vital information for IGCC biology, just an extra piece of information. And then the last point is during exercise, tissues respire at a higher rate and change in breathing volume and rate helps to keep carbon dioxide concentration and pH at safe levels. Now, what happens is when the carbon dioxide concentration increases, your the acidity of the blood increases or in other words the ph level drops and then your blood becomes more acidic your brain picks up a message and then you start breathing faster so that's the correlation with coordination and response we will look in more into detail about this in that chapter but for now that's what you need to know when you uh, when there's more carbon dioxide your blood becomes more acidic your brain picks up the message and then you start breathing deeper and faster. And obviously, during exercise, tissues respire at a higher rate it's because you're using more energy. So when you're when energy is um, released from glucose, you're also releasing carbon dioxide. And so you more carbon dioxide is released. And also while you're using more energy, more glucose and more oxygen is needed because those are the reactants in the in the process of respiration. That's why you're breathing more so that you have more air, more oxygen. It's really a whole cycle that's to keep your cells, your muscle cells especially, uh, well supplied with the reactants needed. Okay, so this is basically what I was explaining earlier. This is the process of breathing, breathing in. It's So when you're breathing in, your external intercostal muscles contract. So then your rib cage is pulled upwards and outwards. Now I want you to breathe in and then you'll notice how your rib cage is expanding and how the volume increases. So that's the next point. Diaphragm muscles contract, the diaphragm moves downwards and then the lung volume increases and pressure decreases or falls. So that's why air is rushing in to your lungs to equalize the pressure to, because there's basically a pressure gradient created and to fulfill this gradient, the air from outside comes inside your lungs to, yeah, to equalize the pressure. The exact opposite is happening when you're breathing out. So when you're breathing out, um, breathe in and breathe out, you'll notice how your volume, the chest volume decreases. 
So the rib cage falls downwards and inwards, and the diaphragm muscles relax. So it returns to a dome shape. Dome shape. And the lung volume decreases and the pressure increases. Now, when the pressure inside the lung increases, the air is forced out once again down the pressure gradient. So the air is returned to the atmosphere. However, you have to remember that the composition of the air is different, and you will have to know why that exactly is. And that's basically what we've discussed so far. Breathing. Um, OK. So mucus and cilia, and these are basically little features that the whole system has. So first of all, we've got mucus and cilia. There are cells called goblet cells lined across the trachea. And they, the, the role of the goblet cells is to produce mucus to trap and eliminate particulate matter, uh, dust or other very small uh, particles, and microorganisms. So the mucus basically traps it. And then, you know, you cough or have snot trying to release that, to remove that from your, expel that from your body. So that's basically what's, what's being described here. You've got mucus produced by goblet cells to trap and uh, remove particulate matter and microorganisms. And then you've got cilia. These are little hair-like structures which sweep back and forth in a coordinated way to brush mucus up the lungs into the mouth. So the mucus obviously it cannot move up by itself. It's being the movement is being facilitated by ciliated cells which have cilia. So these are little hairs. Once again, you'll have to remember the keyword little hairs which sweep back and forth in a coordinated way to brush mucus up the lungs and into the mouth. That's basically what's happening here. And that was chapter 11. Let's look at some questions. This is May, June 2020. What is the site of gas exchange in humans? Nose, no, that's where the air enters from. Alveoli, yes. Bronchus, no. Trachea, nose, yes. The obvious answer is alveoli. The next question, February, March 2022. Compared with inspired air, which description of expired air is correct? It has less oxygen and less carbon dioxide. It does have less oxygen, but it does not have less carbon dioxide. Option B, it has less oxygen and more carbon dioxide. Yes, that's the correct answer. So you don't, you, but sometimes the answer is quite obvious and you don't even have to look any further. Although if you are confused, please read to all of them. And I would also suggest reading to all of them because, you know, being overconfident, it's, it's not always the best idea. And that was chapter 11, Gas Exchange in Humans.